We acknowledge the Yuggera and Ghana nations as traditional custodians of the land on which we work, live and learn, and their continuing connection with the land, waters and community. We pay our respects to them and their elders past and present. All content related to this program is for general informational purposes only and contains stories and discussion around mental health that may be disturbing to some listeners. If you are concerned about yourself or someone you know, please seek professional and individual advice and support. More details are contained in our show notes. Tired of being told you can't exist in a vacuum? Well, now you can. Suck at 3000. We've all had those pesky relationships we just can't get right. Get ready to suck it and hoover up all those people who don't agree with you. Eliminate all of those unnecessary attachments and leave those dirt bags for dust. The new Suck It 3000 is everything you've been looking for. Suck It 3000. When you suck it, you're always right. Because there's nobody left to argue with. Suck it. Wet or dry. Suck it. Suck it. To remove those awkward situations you find yourself in all over again. Suck it. And did we mention you'll never find an opposing opinion ever again? But don't take my word for it. Suck it 3000. I've been a fan of the Suck It range since the Suck It 1000 and got rid of my toxic high school friends. Then the Suck It 2000 got rid of my toxic husband and all of my toxic colleagues. As someone who's always surrounded by so many toxic people, I can't wait to see what the Suck It 3000 cleans up. Suck it. I had to keep changing jobs for decades because of me toxic bosses. But with the Suck It 3000, there's no one left to boss me around. Suck It 3000. My toxic girlfriend kept nagging me to pick up the dirty wet towels off the floor and clean up my messes when I just wanted to decompress after I came home from work and play me Xbox. Then I got the Suck It 3000 onto her. No more nagging and I just stopped using towels. Problem solved. Suck It 3000. What are you waiting for? Call now and start living in your own vacuum today. Suck it. One, two, suck it, 3,000. Suck it, 3,000. Get vacuuming today and see what existing without those annoying other people interacting with you is really like. Suck it, 3,000. I started living in a vacuum and I love it. Suck it. Hello. Hello. Suck it, 3,000. Hello. Hello. Suck it. Don't be anti-vax. Act now. This is the booster you've been waiting for. Suck it, 3000. But wait, there's more. Call in the next 10 minutes and receive this Turbo Rally brush-off head. Suck it. Perfect for all those related by blood stains. Suck it, 3000. What are you waiting for? One, two. Suck it. Suck it, 3000. I feel attacked, Andy. Yeah, well, at least now we're mainly feeling attacked by ourselves, though. That's us. Not living in a vacuum. And this is Reframe of Mind. The podcast that cuts through the platitudes and gets to the core of living authentically, challenging our assumptions and improving mental health with the guidance of good science, philosophy and learning from other people's lived experiences. We're your hosts, Andy Leroy and Louise Poole. And we're at episode 11 of Reframe of Mind now, Andy. Can you believe it? (gasps) I can, but only because we plotted out 42 episodes. What I can't believe is people are still listening. Oh, well, you know, <laughs> it's because we're awesome. Hello. Maybe it's because we're sharing our deep, dark secrets. Or dark, deep secrets. <laughs> According to the paper. Um, yep. We're at that part of our journey where we've been navigating our feelings on some deeply personal matters and responding in ways that support us look as best we know how. Yeah, and we've also at this point embarked on a business venture together called Welcome Change Media and started realising that similar challenges are cropping up for us psychologically as we got more Mm. invested in that. Mm -hmm. Like your little voice that sounded like a parrot on repeat at times saying, (laughs) we don't live in a vacuum. Ah, We don't live in a vacuum. Ah." (laughs) Um, As flattering as that description (laughs) is, it is kind of accurate. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but we wanted to make sure that we weren't clearing the decks only to buy the chairs back from a secondhand dealer to create the same effect. That reminds me uh, very much of your line in the sand analogy that I didn't get then and still don't get now. <laughs> but I'm sure someone that's listening will get it. So long as it's not the Titanic, we're all good. <laughs> 
And when we spoke to Sally Goldner AM last episode, it got us thinking about whether what we've embarked on is really something new or if we've just been trying to recreate what we've been doing all along. We hear a lot, well, sometimes we don't hear about organisations and values. And then sometimes, yeah, we've got an organisation that points to a value statement. I had a really good diagram about this on a webinar I was on a few months ago. And imagine the proverbial archery target. And sure, the centre, the bullseye in the centre is values. And then the next ring out is behaviours. And so the problem is when behaviours aren't consistently reinforced, Um, don't reinforce those values or where people don't look at their behaviours and go, oh, hang on, we're not matching here. That's where things break down. So we're going to take a deep dive into organisational values later in this episode and how this can impact employers and employees. Yeah, and Jane Madden, board member for the Black Dog Institute and chair for the Fred Hollows Foundation, chats to us a little bit later about mental health in the workplace. Mental health is everyone's business and I think it doesn't matter whether you're a student or in corporate, perhaps in a leadership role, whether you're in government or in the not-for-profit sector, that it is everyone's business. And I think the COVID crisis has just brought a new awareness and encouraged even more conversations about mental health in Australia. And mindfulness author and burnout expert Annie Harvey walks us through what to look out for and what can help. I think it's really critical that people know how close they are to what we call falling off the cliff because once you fall off, once you're burnt out, it takes a really long time to heal. It's not like bouncing back, as we like to call it, after a couple of weeks. It can take six months or even up to two years to actually heal from that. So I think we need to take this back to the day we first met Louise. Okay, hang on. Let me get my harp out. (laughs) Okay. Ah. Okay, now that now we're back it in was, time. It was wet season, two thousand and nine. <laughs> Tell someone that that's a very Darwin Northern Territory term. Um, it is <laughs> before they go googling wet season and and it comes up with not family friendly results. Exactly. <laughs> so it was January two thousand and nine, mm-hmm. and I was flying into Darwin for the very first time. I'd never been there before. It was very exciting. I'd lived in Sydney all my life, basically, pretty mm. much, and I was invited to come and work for a radio station on their drive program and to be their music director and i was so excited it's great it was my first commercial radio gig and i gave you that job you did so you you. owe me now bitch (laughs) well (laughs) we'll get down to the accountancy of what (laughs) what you always want a bit later but (laughs) so you you left that job you left me there alone i mean i did whatever um (laughs) And so we didn't work professionally together again until we started this business. So that's what, I mean, 10, 12 years? Well, look, I left Darwin in 2010. So that's when I moved to Adelaide. So yeah, it's 12 years, Mm. pretty much 11 years had elapsed by the time we started talking about Welcome Change Media. And you went into which industries? Okay. So when I moved to Adelaide, I went and managed a community radio station for a little while. Mm -hmm. And then I... Moved around a little bit career-wise, so I took various leadership positions in a few different places. So I've managed things from a little team in aged care doing resident lifestyle through to telecommunications and internet. I even worked on a help desk at one point. Teaching people. That's why I'm so good with the computers. To turn their computers on and off. Switch it on and switch it back on again. Yeah, power cycle it. Um, It's out of scope, madam. I'm sorry. I don't deal with Microsoft (laughs) Mail, but I'm willing to help you because I've got great customer service skills, that kind of stuff. And, you know, I was quite happy in that because I'd worked in call centres before working in radio and I'd worked in office jobs. You know, I'd been in a government position before you employed me. I was seven years working for a government agency before that. Mm. So I guess I went back to a comfort zone. You know, I didn't enter media from a young age, so it didn't feel like it was necessarily my path like that so I I went back and did other things and I was quite happy yeah but there was still that itch Mm. there's always that itch Mm -hmm. and my journey is I suppose the opposite of yours I did start in media from a young age I've often said I've never had a real job because every paid job I've ever had has been working in commercial media in some way shape or form I don't Mm. know what it's like to do something else I don't know what it's like to stack shelves at Woolies Neither do I. (laughs) (laughs) My my world has been this uh, insular media thing. And so after we parted ways in Darwin, I ended up uh, moving to a couple of other jobs, but eventually making my way to Brisbane and being on the radio, doing the music. 
I spent eight and a bit years pretty much in the number one and two slot of Brisbane commercial radio in the mornings. So while I was assisting in some ways to lift people to the toilet, you were actually speaking to people in a prime time position. Well, they were on the toilet, probably. They were probably on the toilet. I I, I would have been beaming (laughs) directly to your loo. I was there with you when you were in the car on the way to work and you picked your nose and you thought no one could see you because you were in the car and it's like a little fortress. (laughs) Motion by motion with (laughs) Louise Poole. I I was there with you when you were shopping and you heard someone talk right up to the start of a song and you thought, why don't they just play the song? (laughs) Why can't they just play the intro and not talk (laughs) over it in the wreck head? Because in Radio World, we have these competitions where we talk to the post. Mm. So you're never, ever going to get a situation where they're not going to talk over it. That kind of wraps up, I don't know, that's 10 years in three minutes, right? That's about... I think so, yeah. That's the, the very, very shortened a, edition. <laughs> do you need to play the outgoing harp or are we good? Um, I mean, I can get it. Should I, I, I'll play it backwards. Hang on. Sounds a lot like it does forwards, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. doesn't yeah. sound a lot different. No. So we started this business, Welcome Change Media, with both of those backgrounds. That's mm-hmm. where we come mm-hmm. from. And we got together in 2020 to make it, and we genuinely wanted to make something that has never been done before, but the way we imagine it to be. Yeah, and boy, was it easy for us to let our imaginations run wild. It was With it? the excitement of everything we wanted to do and what we knew we were capable of doing. And I think at that time when we first started, what you needed to work on was letting go of being that un- Underling or assistant, that old mm. boss dynamic that you had with me because we were 50-50 mm-hmm. in a partnership. Yeah, and I think in the same way, you need to let go of um, doing everything all the time to justify making things that you want to make. <gasps> Called out. Ooh, ouch. <laughs> and personally, I think we've been changed by the experiences in between that led us to this point as well. So... I think we need to throw back now to just a little under a year ago. Um, We just Mm -hmm. started the business. Episode one is a really good point to that beginning where uh, my radio career had ended and Andy had experienced a major shift in family dynamics after his dad had died. Um, We'd just gotten Welcome Change Media going and then we had to take on some other opinions. Yeah. Yeah. So, as we're starting the new venture together, excited about all the possibilities, this is where we started to have to contend with our partner's concerns about money not coming in while we focused on building things the way we wanted to in the right way. It has and it still does at times lead us to wonder if we're making decisions that are right for us or if they're ones that we feel like we have to make to be successful. Yeah we don't want to just go around taking money off any random sort of person that wants to give it to us because we need to make sure that what we're helping them to promote is also in line with our values. It's that authenticity isn't it? It is yeah and a couple of episodes ago in episode Episode 9, we met Hugh Kearns, who is a lecturer and researcher in the area of high performance at Flinders University. And Hugh gave us an interesting perspective on this related to the imposter syndrome. We sometimes use our own imposter syndrome to deflect that onto other people. An example I'm thinking of is recently when Louise and I played an early audio draft to some of our friends. Our significant others consistently between the two of them told us that our part of it wasn't that great, but the other person's was, <laughs> which was a bit strange. <laughs> yeah. We're still holding it against them. <laughs> yes, well, well, first of all, um, I suppose well, as, a, as an outsider observing, I'd be thinking, well, well, let's look at the facts here. You know, I don't know. Maybe that's true. Uh, maybe it is the case. You know, let's all listen to it. Or maybe, uh, and again, it'll probably be to do with their expectations of you as well. They'll be thinking, well, you have done, so you should do more. Or if the other person has never talked before, maybe they were good because they started. So people have a whole range of expectations. So, so I suppose what I'd be trying to do is sit down objectively and look at it and go, what, what is going on here? Was that the case? And it could be maybe the present, maybe the person you're interviewing was just awesome and that's brilliant. And uh, uh, or maybe you did get it wrong, or maybe not. And so uh, again, uh, uh, without actually having seen the event, I, I'm not so sure what would really be going on there. So yeah, so uh, <laughs> I'd be having a little chat with your significant other and say, well, it would be nice here as well. Yeah, it was just an interesting um, sidetrack for us because normally we turn to our significant other. Mm -hmm. family, friends for the default praise. And that's often something that we'll use to say, oh, well, you know, they would say that because we're we're so closely linked. Um, Just seemed like a really odd turnaround. uh, Here's a little secret you can let let, tell your families as well or or anyone. When when anybody ever asks you for feedback, they probably don't want feedback at all. They just want someone to tell you that (laughs) you were right. (laughs) 
Absolutely. And so that's a, you know, this is a this is a um a, a little bit of relationship tip you learn early on in life. You know, when your partner asks, you know, what do you really think? <laughs> that's not what they mean. Uh, Love it. Be careful. Love it. That's right. Yeah, yeah that's Thinking right. I love it. Yeah, you know, when, when your when your partner is trying on clothes and you say, "How does this this look on me? This looks great. <laughs> yes, looks amazing. So, so, yes, it's amazing. You look great in that. So yeah, so you got to be a little bit careful about uh, why people give feedback or when they ask for it. You know, how honest do you really want to be? So what Hugh said actually caused us to have a think about our expectations that we're placing on ourselves. Andy, I think it's time to. Get out the harp. Go for it. <laughs> so cast your mind back again um, mm. <laughs> because this our story <laughs> is taking place in two different timelines. It's starting to be a uh, very tenet here. Um, <laughs> Not to get too revolving doors about it all, but... <laughs> Um, because we're telling you a story uh, around stuff that was happening to us when we were first interviewing these guests, and that was last year. So last episode, you heard from Sally Goldner AM in our real time now, but we actually spoke to Sally Goldner almost a year ago in the other timeline. Yeah, and I think it's fair to say that we were both in pretty different headspaces at the time mm. from where we were coming from on our own personal journeys. You know, for me, you know, we've, we've said different parts of recapping the series so far that I'd just lost my father and that's true and he still hasn't come back because he died. Yeah. But where I was within all that as well, not to be too flippant about it, is that my whole model of the world changed when he died because the family of Orient orientation which i've covered as a concept some episodes back episode one i think that was mm. now anybody who cares to listen back to that one it, it kind of speaks to the family that you're born into traditionally if you are living the prescribed heterosexual life you'll go and find a partner you'll have children and then you'll create your own family of procreation so when my father died that was the linchpin of my family of orientation that was then gone so then the family tree splits into its own boughs and, you know, I'm the end. I'm the beginning and the end of my my branch. So I don't have any children. And, you know, I've talked about that in different ways and different kind of emotional states over the years. <laughs> I'm quite okay with all of that, yeah. you know. But at that point, this was all very raw for me yeah. when we were speaking to Sally. Yeah. So it, it kind of became apparent to me at one point that even though I have been out as gay since I was 24, which is, you know, a good 26 years or so ago now, I still acted in certain ways to shield people from what I thought was unacceptable about that part of me. So, you know, the relationships that I have had were accepted by my family and my partners were accepted by my family. And for that, you know, I'm really grateful and I sh it shouldn't even have to be an issue or something to be having to say that I'm grateful for or declare that I'm mm. grateful for because it should just be his Andy's partner, you know. But it's not always the case. And there are certain things that I've mentioned that have happened growing up as well where before I even I was aware that I was gay, but I became aware that my family didn't approve of gay people very early in life. And thankfully, that had changed by the time they actually realised that they had someone who was gay in their own family, mostly. So, you know, there, there's all of this editing of your personality and... Self-editing. We're doing that to ourselves. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Self-editing is, is definitely what's going on there because we want to make sure that we are projecting an acceptable version of ourselves to the people that we love because if we don't, we'll be rejected. Mm, which, uh, another throwback, and, and I, I've put the harp away temporarily, but um, <laughs> <laughs> episode five, we spoke to Joe Forgus about that in regards to tribalism um, and, and that mm. concept of being rejected from the tribe and how evolutionarily that wasn't a good thing because, you know, being thrown out of the tribe meant dead, eaten by a tiger. Those feelings still hang over even though we're no longer living in, you know, the jungle. So to come back to the point of where I was also psychologically when we were speaking to Sally, mm. you know, all of this stuff that we've spoken to Joe about is also really, really pivotal in how I'm starting to really relate to myself now as well because suddenly at this point I'm wanting to break free from just passively accepting other people's comments and other people's opinions and trying to mold myself to them because you know that kind of says that their truth is more important than me or my mm. truth so you know this is kind of where some of the questions that I'm asking and some of the insights that I'm starting to glean from these conversations are really starting to make a real impact on me valuing myself fully valuing myself 
And it's tricky too because one of the things you've maintained from the beginning is, as we've been talking this whole thing, is that you don't want the relationships that you already have with people that you love to end. Um, but you want to rebuild them in a way that's authentic and honest and honest for you when the timing's right. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, when I talk about certain patterns of behaviour, I talk about a tendency for families or friendship groups. I don't know whether it's necessarily an Australian thing or whether it's particular to certain types of people or certain people, but there is this whole situation where we find a common a common like weakling to yeah. to set ourselves yeah. on. So it's either your typical laughing stock or it's your typical person who is the villain or, you know, insert other here. Mm, if we all get together and other somebody else, then we can have uh, something in common. That's right. And, and that's that tribal sameness that we build around that. And I'd noticed over a lot of years that that pattern of relating had crept into a lot of my relationships, not just family, but I could pinpoint it from friendship circles from years ago. And even looking at recent friendships as well, I can still see that trying to creep in. And I've really got to pull myself back and remind myself that that's not actually who I am and not actually what I want. And if I keep participating in it, then I'm only going to keep getting it. Do you think you were feeling that you weren't equal to everybody else? Oh, yeah, absolutely. What people say rings true when they say, you know, if somebody is talking about somebody else that way, what are they saying about you? Because I have a lot of empathy, because I actually do listen to people and do relate to them and tr- do try to put myself in their shoes, that then extends to, oh, hang on a minute, <laughs> so what's wrong with me now? Like, if, if this person is worthy of being laughed at for this reason, then what am I worthy of being laughed at for? How am I weird? What am I doing that's, you know, not acceptable? So, yeah, there are lots of ways that I felt like I wasn't equal. I can talk about this in terms of, okay, let's go right back to childhood and let's go back to the youngest child. Do you want me to get the heart out? I get the heart out. Look, I think you're going to need a harpsichord for this one (laughs) because we're going back to medieval times. (laughs) I don't have a button for that. Hang on. What else have I got over here? That's a distant memory of Harpo and his first appearance in an interview. That's the I don't have a harpsichord. It turns out I have a harp and a cat meow. And a cat called Harpo meowing. (laughs) So close enough. Um, Being the youngest child, in my experience, manifested in me feeling inadequate in a lot of ways because I was always the one that had to be taught. I was always the one that didn't know enough. I was always the one that thought they knew better and didn't actually know that kind of bullshit. It's taken a long time for me to grow out of that mindset and to take myself out of that and to actually value myself and to value the experience that I've got. Because when I interact with other people outside of that dynamic, they don't see that person. They don't see that version of me. I've commented before how a previous partner would say to me that when I was with my family, I was a completely different person. And it's true because Mm -hmm. I was re-entering that old script, that old pattern of behavior that... I felt that I had to, to be acceptable. Otherwise, look out. So, yeah, I mean, to come back to your your question about whether I felt equal or not, like a lot of the times, no. And I know that came out as well early on in our business relationship, in our partnership, Mm. where I kept referring to you as the one in charge or, you know, feeling like you were the boss or the overarching kind of... Waiting for me to give the final approval on something that we do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, that's always how I've worked as well. I've always gone to my boss and gone, approved, not approved, whatever when probably I didn't even necessarily need to do that. So at this stage of the game, when we're talking to Sally in that interview, but certainly now as well, you know, I'd never be happy to return to what was business as usual, you know, living in that same autopilot way of relating, then walking away and feeling privately undervalued and that I wasn't an equal in my relationships, whether it was family or friends. Or business partners. I think this part of the interview with Sally really speaks to what you're talking about. I kind of feel also maybe I've done myself a disservice by towing the line for all of those years and not standing up for who I actually am. I think there's mixed thoughts there. I mean, hindsight's a wonderful thing and we can Mm. only keep growing ourselves. I think that that's the responsibility we have to ourselves as an individual and then to each other. I'm going to leap into something that's been a bit of a pet topic lately and that's about leadership. You know, to me, leadership is about strengthening I'm going to be bold and try to define it. Leadership is about strengthening other people. But we can only do more of that and do it more effectively when we strengthen ourselves. And that means growing ourselves and unlearning things. And I'm still doing it. 
So it's funny how you said that at the time we spoke to Sally, originally you were kind of referring to me for the decisions and letting me take the lead on things because that was that old dynamic that we had in place, that old boss Mm. employee dynamic. Because actually when it came to talking to Sally um, for the first time, I don't know if you noticed this in the interview, but I let you run most of the first, I suppose, first 20 minutes or so of the interview because I was at a place where I wasn't really ready to claim ownership of parts of myself. Hmm. Um, Which I pointed out afterwards when we heard the interview back. (laughs) And I went, that's interesting. (laughs) That was an interesting way to phrase that. What did you mean by that? Well, uh, look, after okay, after we were speaking to Sally for, uh, I think it was probably about maybe 15 or 20 minutes, and Sally is lovely and an absolute riot of a person, and she has a way of making you feel very comfortable. I think the conversation got very deep and personal, and it was the first time in any interview that I told someone this. I often talk about like this idea of comp head because I feel like I'm a late blooming identifying as not straight. And that's because of like that wasn't, it's just, you know, wasn't a thing. You know, I, mm. if, if there's an attraction to men, then I must be straight until you look at it and go, well, what about all the other things that you're not admitting or talking about? And those are internal biases that I had. You know, I, I think in my early uh, 20s, I probably would have said, oh, I'm very straight, but also in the same sentence said, but I don't really find men all that attractive and women are far more, <laughs> far more yeah. attractive. Um, but that's just, do you get what I mean, Sally? Yeah. 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 Look, we have these emotions that take deep root. And as I say, then they're buried under that top layer of coming out in the first place. And then we've all got stuff as a person, I suppose, that combines in with it as well. And if you if a person is a heterosexual, cisgender, etc., cetera, then uh, maybe they don't think to tackle it. But I know for me, I found that once I sort of started going down the rabbit hole, sometimes I didn't really want to keep going, but I suppose I did. But it is about wanting to learn and taking responsibility and having the willingness and ability to, to face these things. And some of those things, as I say, can be too strong. to to face that's not easy and so that we can remain blocked and that was something that really it wasn't comfortable for me that's why i I started all over that and you so kindly made fun of me for it after (laughs) well you know i mean it's easy for me isn't it you know i've been like coming out for 26 years you've been a late blooming identifying as not straight for 26 years (laughs) (laughs) kind of not the same flavor as you certainly but yes (laughs) Do you know, okay, when we started working together, like, harp, harp. When we started working together for the second incarnation uh, back in 2021. Yeah. We're, we're in 2022 now, yeah? God, we've lost yeah, it yeah, yeah. somewhere. Um, I know. <laughs> I think maybe a few weeks into us working together, you said something and then I forget what it, I forget what it was. Um, and then I said, well, actually... Um, because you had no idea that I wasn't straight either. No, I didn't. And we were talking a, a lot around about what kind of groups we could actually try and, you know, seek interview sources from and what kind of messages that we wanted to support or not support or otherwise. And then the conversation turned at one point to you actually coming out to me as Pan. And at that point in just the, the general life thing, I think maybe three or four people knew. And that was it. Yeah. I had yeah. I had realised it and come to that understanding a few years earlier. Um, but, you know, being in a, a heterosexual identifying relationship at the time, I had felt that I didn't get to claim myself as part of, you know, an LGBTQIA plus kind of community as long as I'm presenting in a heterosexual relationship. And so that was one of the reasons why I didn't say anything about it. Um My family, by the way, were in the number of people I hadn't told. Uh, I only told my mother just before this podcast was released in case she listened to it, but she didn't, so, you know, didn't have to. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Lucky. (laughs) It was something that... I felt really uncomfortable saying. It is, though. Coming out's never easy, you know. It's uh, especially the first time you do it because there is so much risk. You know, I 
have been through coming out experiences in all of the 26 years since I first came out because people make an assumption that you're heterosexual. You know, it, it comes down to those moments where, you know, in a nursing home, just doing an activity with one of the residents, they said to me, have you got any kids? How many kids have you got? Mm-hmm. And I said, no, I don't have any kids. Oh, how come? You know, and, and so the conversation goes. It's constantly bucking against those assumptions of society that you're a certain gender, you're a certain age, therefore one plus one equals two. And humanity is not like that. Um, So it's not easy. 2017. Mm. um, Do I need a double harp for this? I don't... I think so. I think you need harp with a little squeak from Harpo at the end. (laughs) We're going to have to produce that later. We're going to have to produce that later. (laughs) Um, It's it's a harp, Harpo. 2017, (laughs) uh, marriage equality survey. Traumatising for... Good Lord. Yes, the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, Because... Again, somebody's human rights, their, their their right to just even exist as a person is up for debate. Um, and everyone's got an opinion and everyone wants to tell you to it. Yes. Everyone, whether they agree with it or not. Whether it has anything to do with opinion. them or not. Yeah, great. Thanks for sharing your opinion. Um, Go away. Um, that for me at that time, uh, before that, I probably would have told you I identified as straight and I probably would have believed that about myself. Mm-hmm. Except then when the Marriage Equality Survey came about, I was really angry and I was really hurt. I was really upset by the fact that, you know, not just from a human rights point of view, but uh, the, the persecution of, of that community. I had to ask myself, why was I so passionate and um, affected by that? And it's also very difficult if you're feeling confusion at the very least to then you know put yourself out there as even an ally because then that would turn the headlights straight around to you and there you are speaking up on behalf of a group and why are you doing that you know because yep. people don't do that unless they've got a personal stake in it it was is the common <laughs> assumption so one of the things that i mentioned with sally in that interview was that the, the marriage equality survey was really the first time that i mentioned i suppose you know mainstream LGBTQIA issues on commercial radio um, and I felt uncomfortable doing that. Even on on the morning that they were announcing the results, it was, you know, it was just before or just after 9am. They were scheduled to come at 9am and I'm sitting there in my studio and I'm um, watching and waiting and my first break goes to air and I, it's like, I think I said something along the lines of whatever happens this morning um, with the results, I just, you know, want the LGBTQIA plus community listening to know that I hear you and I'm here for you or something like that. I will say, so that morning I I said that in the first break, I basically said, you know, you, the community has my support. Um, I hope this turns out for us today. Um, it, the proverbial us, which is not really implicating anybody, it's the kind of you know, no one, no one who's straight notices the proverbial us. And then the results came through. And so like five minutes later, you know, um, I did the good news about the results and blah, 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 blah. Then that morning, not, not very long after that, I said to someone in the building and I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to out them in a non, you know, out way, mm. but I did say, how wonderful is that this morning that the survey came through like that and the majority of people support marriage equality. And they said back to me, it's good to see democracy works. And that's when I realised that that person didn't feel the same way I felt about it. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, it is good democracy works. They obviously made a different selection on the survey form than I did. They said, it's good to see (laughs) democracy works. Um. Uh, yeah. Um. <laughs> look, you know, going back to what Joe Forges said to us back in episode five, I think the danger of howling people down and saying they can't have a different opinion is that they'll just not vocalise it, but they'll still think it. Yeah. You know? and yeah, and that's what I felt. So long as they don't come at me with their shitty opinions and try to make me feel bad with their opinions, I'm happy for someone to think whatever they like about me. But as soon as they start to attack me, just like I wouldn't attack anybody with my opinion, that whole thing of live and let live, I think, 
is something that we've really forgotten. I think the other part of that, though, is that, you know, people say don't polarise anything, don't rock the boat. Like if you're in, in media, you know, don't get people offside, don't alienate your listeners because if, what was the number in the end? 56% of Australians support marriage equality. Well, there's still 44% that don't and they're still listeners yeah. as well. But it's so much of a bigger question of who do you want to be and what do you want to stand for? And to get 100% of the people all the time, you'd have to agree to some pretty terrible shit to whoever yeah. is listening. And it's not necessarily in line with your beliefs and your values. And that's, I think, where the importance of being able to to live and you know express your own values is important too, because why should anybody settle for something that is less than what they expect for themselves? You know, like there's probably a more eloquent way to put it. I'm not saying that go out and vilify people who are different to you. That's completely the opposite to what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that nobody, if they feel a certain way, should feel that they have to just accept somebody else's words or deeds and feel like they have to keep the peace by saying nothing in defense of themselves. Mm. Because I've been in that situation plenty of times myself and it's not a great place. It's not somewhere that you want to be. And, you know, there are plenty of people with lots of different causes going on at the moment. And, you know, I can specify, you know, like things like these freedom marches, for example, that are happening at the moment where legitimately people are feeling upset by actions or, or inaction in certain ways from different groups like they have been let down yeah. you know in one yeah. way or another and it it's a very common feeling generally across the population but to then go to the extreme and say string them up or you know whatever insert violent action here and then polarize different groups against each other because they're getting more than us or whatever it it's got to stop, you know, because uh, we shouldn't be in a position where people are being prioritised over another because of a difference or a perceived difference or being told that. It's like that whole reverse racism argument, which is complete bullshit. We've had this conversation about quotas and things before. Mm. Until we get equity. We can't have equality. Then, correct. One of the things I always say, and I've said this to you before, I don't know if I've said it in the show, um, but it, it's kind of at the basis for reframe of mind just in general, is that I do not believe that anybody who feels their own personal value ever wants to take value away from anybody else. And if you feel your own self-love, then you don't hate on anybody. I think the way to the world being a better place is to teach people, to, to help them empower themselves, to love themselves, to see their value, to work on their own feelings and emotions and to claim ownership of that because if you if you value yourself, you you don't need to other anybody else. You you don't need to compete with anybody else. You can support other people. I just don't think you can feel hate and love at the same time. So if we can teach people to find a way to love themselves, then there's going to be a whole lot less hate. Yeah, and I completely agree. And also I want to add to that, you know, like phrases like that can very easily be, you know, laughed at or turned into a laughing point of, oh, you know, you're just being a hippie, you're just being peace and love and all that kind of bullshit. No, like there is actually great value in valuing yourself because when you value yourself, you don't feel like you have to act in certain ways to get something. And when we come from a place of lack and we come from a place of competition and come from a place of they've got more than me, then that only breeds hatred. So if we can bring ourselves to a place where we value ourselves and know that you know, what we are doing is ethical and is responsible and is actually in support of people and support of the greater good, for want of a better term, then that's the point I think we can actually be satisfied with what we've got. And it's not a case of just be grateful for what you've got. No. You know, we don't want to kind of set up this whole... It's not. We're not toxic positivity in this either. No, 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 no. Exactly. But we have to come to a point where we do value ourselves to the point where we know that we are good enough, that we know that we are capable, that we know that we can learn something if we don't know it, and to stop dumping on ourselves. And when we stop dumping on ourselves, we stop dumping on other people. So in all those years of working in commercial radio, you did... You mentioned that you related to yourself as being heterosexual, even back when marriage equality was being debated, and that's being generous in my terminology. Yeah. Did you feel at any point before that, though, thinking back now, you've got the safety of hindsight and the safety to be able to say, actually, there's a point where I might have been attracted to the same sex. Did, did you ever feel moments of that that you can remember? Yeah, and in hindsight now, that's <laughs> not something that I ever 
felt like I could own while I was working in commercial radio. And I know that it's not about any individual in any way you've worked because, yeah, I think in a lot of places, industries, society, there is this underlying homophobia still that, you know, we've seen a recent debate with transphobia at, at its edge. So all of those things are still bubbling underneath. Maybe this bit of the interview with Sally explains this well. That starts from the top too. Like I think of my experiences, like having worked in commercial media for 20 plus years, the, the people who, are the employees, the people who are there, we want to make change. A lot of us do. We want to, mm. um, you know, we, we want to tell diverse stories, but the pressure comes from further up the chain of, you know, that doesn't relate to your average listener, your average demographic who we're after. And there's a lot of black and white in that. But in that same vein as well, though, you know, we used to have things like diverse inclusion studies anonymously come out every year and every year I'd answer well where are all the people of colour in this office because in the whole time I've been there I could only see two is that really you know tick boxes how, how many people do I publicly know that identify you know on the LGBTIQA plus scale because again there was probably only three but statistically there would have been a lot more people myself included as kind of a closet pansexual at the time that didn't feel comfortable sharing that and therefore probably, mm. you know, because that culture from the top is even if it is of uh, yes, we're, we've got to float in Mardi Gras so we must be inclusive. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah, but uh, don't, don't speak about it, don't talk about it. So it's 2017 and the marriage equality debate, to use the term very generously, mm -hmm. is is happening and there are plenty of media identities who have same-sex partners who even have children so what made it different for you it wasn't like one person specifically ever said don't be gay you can't be gay i mean it wasn't <laughs> <laughs> you're right there were other people who were out um quite a lot of other people who were out something i find really interesting is you know i make fun of the alpha douche as being that um cisgendered straight white middle-aged man who's in charge of things but you know mm. in the radio industry there are actually middle-aged white men who aren't straight in charge of things. What perpetuates or what makes me feel like that culture of not being gay is not allowed when people who are, you know, gay are in charge? I think that someone's sexuality doesn't mean that they're an ally to their group. Just because someone is gay doesn't mean that they protect other members of the gay community. I can certainly certainly attest to that. that different parts of the the rainbow community as we kind of yeah to call it now yeah when people when there's not a lot of people from a particular group or minority who succeed in something it's similar to what we were talking about with suzanne that time where she said that a lot of women who make it to positions of power feel like they have to be men in skirts and bust some balls and act in that same kind of alpha douchey way um, mm. I think that people, when they're from marginalised groups, sometimes get into a position of power through their own tenacity and um, through the compromises that they've had to make uh, about themselves and their beliefs on the way to be able to fit into that more mainstream mould that when they do get into a position of power, they don't use that power to amplify or help the other people in their community along the way. They are worried about keeping their power and so they also other people, maybe in less overt ways or not even that they contribute to the culture and make the culture worse, but they don't try and change the culture even when they get into a position of power. It's dangerous for them to challenge that because yeah. they are in the minority and yes. one vocal voice is seen as an activist and someone who's dangerous and someone who will change things for the worse, you know? Like, I remember actually when I started in Darwin. Hup, and you'd hup, hup. Sure. Okay. <laughs> it's almost a double harp moment because we're going back not just <laughs> no, <laughs> not just twelve months, but twelve years. A harp and a harpo, <laughs> and then another harp. Exactly. Yeah. This is a twelve-year jump, not a twelve-month jump. So, when we first met, you knew that I was gay. You know, mm -hmm. I 
was at the point in my journey of life where I I was out. I wasn't hiding it. Anybody who asked, I willingly told. I didn't go out, you know, announcing it from the rooftops or anything because I didn't climb steps that well. I still don't. And that's only because I'm lazy. It's not a gay stereotype. Gays don't climb steps. No, not no, at all. No. And I'm not trying to be ableist either. No. So I, um, oh yeah, I arrived and I was going on shift onto the drive program and I was, you know, starting to toss around a few ideas for things that I could do. It could be fun and, um, uh, I know what you're going to say, and I know it's not going to paint me in a very good light, so I'd like to preface it. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to preface it with um, I was 26 when we had this conversation, I think. Yes, you, you, you were 26. And also it harks back to, you know, a possible unconscious desire to be the man in the skirt or the mm-hmm. need to, oh, yeah. the well, desire, but the need to be the man in the, the skirt. i previous episodes that I've done things in the past that would be considered the uh, ball-busting man in the skirt thing, and I think mm. you're about to discuss one of the things that I have said. You weren't nasty. I've got to say that. You were, you've never been nasty, but... You know, <laughs> My it, criticism it, is polite. You know, and through the conversation, it, it became apparent that you were telling me that it wasn't a good idea to be gay on air, that the station, because of its listenership, because of the target demographic, didn't have space for a gay personality on there because Mm. it didn't fit the branding of the station. I I took it because, you know, if 12 months ago I was in a place where I wasn't actually (laughs) saying what was important to me and standing up for it, I certainly wasn't going to do it 12 years ago when I was in my first commercial radio gig. So I swallowed it. So Because if I was 26-year-old Louise, you were 36-year-old Andy at this point too. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Exactly. We were both spring chickens back Mm -hmm, then. mm -hmm. We were in a different place of our journey. I was exceptionally grateful to have been given the opportunity to be on air in such a great market on commercial radio. So what you said was correct because we had a listening audience that we needed to to cater to and going by the demographic and the target of that audience, they were likely to hold certain beliefs or certain values. And those values really only extended out as far as we were being the feel-good station. So having a big gay bow in the middle of breaks. I never, I never said the I word know. gay bow, by the way, before, <laughs> before the Daily Mail picks up an article saying former, former radio host called co-host a gay bow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm taking license here. But but the longer the short of it is, you know, to have an over-the-top, gay I suppose, stereotypical <laughs> gay personality, which I was which I've never been anyway, no. but that's beside the point. But I that it wouldn't have fitted the sound of the station overall. So I mean, I'm sure this happens with any radio announcer because they have to think about their demographic and who they're actually talking to. But there are certain elements of their personality that you just won't hear. Um, because uh, the advertisers will pull their money if it goes against their values, that's for sure. Yeah. I've I've said this to you before in a non-recorded podcast conversation, but I am sorry that I ever did that. Oh, I know. Yeah, um, we're well past that. <laughs> <laughs> We're in business together now, honey. I'm sorry that I did a lot of things <laughs> to a lot of people that, uh, you know, that again, 26-year-old Louise did because she felt like she had to prove something. Because I think when I talk about that person um, that that reaches the top and then doesn't support the other people from their own community, like that would have been me then. I'm talking about what would this have been, 2008? 2009. But also, like, how are you supposed to have that kind of wisdom at 26 years of age? Isn't well, some the responsibility? People, some people are smart, I guess. Some people, some, well, okay, people who didn't repress their sexuality for 40 fucking years might have. Yeah, but without dumping on yourself, though, like, if the culture itself was such that, you know, it didn't expect you to uphold that value, would you be upholding it? You know, like, and not coming to individuals again, but if through a whole industry, this whole sense can kind of trickle down that, well, the most important thing is that we only speak to people with this value, this value and this value, and we don't mention this other stuff because that's just too hard. I want to add as well that came from a place of actually feeling like I was trying to protect you. I didn't want you to get attacked and I wanted you to be successful. And I had already had several years of experience knowing how much more difficult that would be if you were the gay beau. Um, (laughs) Because it's got a limited lifespan, that kind of personality and that kind of... um, And also not wanting you to become a stereotype and a a, a fucking... um, like a token woman, but you're the token gay and the only thing you can ever comment on is reality TV and go, oh, my God, yes, go, Kim, go. You, but you know you what? You know, like it's 
it doesn't value you as a person. Um, Correct. And yeah. in 2009, as I'm now told, at 2009, <laughs> like, forget to 2022. We live in an entirely different time now. Um, oh, yeah. 2009. This was like, I think, even just as the first iPhone was coming out, right? Um, yeah, Think it about was. The, it was... the attitudes around in 2009 regarding the expectations of the LGBT IQA plus community and the only gay we saw really represented on TV was the Will and Grace gay. Yeah, it was It was still there. In my mind, it wasn't because, you know, I kind of knew what went before me. People say that we, we stand on, on the shoulders of yeah. giants. And certainly, you know, from what I'd learned when I came out and through the people that I'd met after coming out, I knew what had gone before me as far as all of the activism and all of the protests and all of the mm. hatred that had been sort of slung at my community, my community up until, well, it, it still does. It still does. To be honest. Yeah. Like to me, I didn't have the sense of that. And actually it was a very good thing for you to be able to be there and protect me in that way because had I gone on with a sense that people will accept me for whoever I am anyway, it's still bullshit. It, that's still not so, you know. People will still try to tell me that I'm not good enough for one reason or another. Some people will still even ask me which one's the man in our relationship mm. or which one's the woman. In one of the questions I phrased to Sally, when we heard it back, we went, oh, that sounds a bit off, but but I stand by it, you know. I, I think that in a lot of these arguments, a lot of these news stories we hear and a lot of the commentary we hear, the people who are most self-righteous are so obsessed with what people do in the bedroom and they mm -hmm. are so obsessed with what people have got between their legs and what they do with them. It is just the most hypocritical position that I can think of for people to have those sorts of points of view and then try and turn it around to say that the other people are the deviants. When they're just minding their own business, trying to live their life like anybody else and to love someone their way in a consensual way, in a loving way, to be told, no, you're wrong. Like, we're talking very specifically about media, and we're now talking about media in 2009. Um, mm -hmm. I'm trying to get across that this is something that is happening from our background. It may not be about an industry that everybody can relate to, but this is happening in so many industries. Yeah, if yeah. there is that covert feeling that it's not okay to be you in whatever way, you know, whether that's sexuality, whether it's culture, whether it's disability, you know, if there is a sense that you cannot be your whole self in whatever way that means, then people don't feel comfortable challenging that status quo in an environment where they are already a minority figure. There was well, no way that I was going to say to my boss, because you were my boss and you had a boss above you, so I wasn't certainly wasn't going to say it to them, but I was not going to walk in there and say, well, look, I'm gay, just deal with it, I'm going to say what I like, because... You know, I came in accepting certain rules as well. I came into a new job and I was learning the ropes in the new industry for me and I wanted to do the very best I could and I had to respect certain rules because really, you know, and this also comes back to what would I know, but realistically, what did I know at that point about commercial radio and how it worked and how audiences and branding and marketing around all those sorts of things happened? So, of course, I was going to toe the line. Of course, I wasn't going to be anything larger than what was required. And that's my choice. That was my choice. I could have gone, no, nah, fuck that, and, and moved back to Sydney, but I didn't. And we make these choices to compromise ourselves because we care. I think sometimes we care so much more about the thing that we're doing and what that means to us than about the, our own values. Um, and that's something we have to kind of come to ourselves. A another aside, I once had a intern Mm -hmm. Lovely person. And mm. they really, really, really wanted to get into radio. And then they did. I gave them a great reference and I gave them as much experience as I could give them. They ended up getting a job in regional radio and they called me up crying because their probationary period wasn't extended. So they weren't fired. But it was because, unlike you, they didn't toe the line and they were openly gay. Yeah, they didn't fit the sound of the station. Yeah. Which is a real shitty thing. You know, like, <laughs> I, I don't know, like I've got a very different kind of perspective on it now and, 
any advertiser that came to me and said, well, we're going to pull our dollars from you because you are gay or whatever, I would say, well, take your fucking money. I don't care. I don't want it because you're not important to me. And by the way, neither is your product. There are plenty of others out there that I can get which are different because I don't need your bigotry behind Mm. your dollars. And I suppose this conversation about culture isn't just about gayness. I, at some point, found myself in these jobs protecting people for expressing their own opinions. When you you say that thing about, you know, I'll take my advertising dollars elsewhere. Well, Mm. I I had to many times stand up and say, no, like advertising dollars doesn't um, control editorial content. There have been things in the past where, you know, I've ended up in arguments with people um, higher than myself because advertisers haven't necessarily been happy that, let's say, a hypothetical scandal happened and it involved a large company not doing the right thing and then it was reported on uh, in the news. It was also discussed by the hosts of, say, you know, one of the shows. I, I had, was asked sometimes to bury stories. Don't run those stories because... Mm-hmm. They're a client. I can specifically remember having a bat for some other content makers who had made some comments, not untruthful, not defamatory, nothing like that, but had made some personal comments about what they thought of a situation that was topical. But because it was about an advertiser, the advertiser wanted an apology. They want to basically say, we're going to pull our money if you don't put us in a positive light. We will do whatever the hell we like and expect you not to pass negative comment about it. There's a couple more stories I want to add before we move on to the next part of this, Andy, if that's okay with you. Go on. These are stories aimed at a generalisation of what media culture is like slash was like, I don't know, haven't been in it for two years, I can only go yeah, by my past change. experience, and how this culture is probably similar in and most likely similar in other industries. So one, X amount of years prior, before the Marriage Equality Survey, I had a heated debate with somebody who was in charge about marriage equality. They were adamant that marriage should only be, be between a man and a woman and anything else was disgusting. And I was very heated in my response to that and advocating for equality. It was not a fun argument and it completely changed the way I looked at that person because up until that point, I, you know, I really respected them. But so fast forward to 2017, that same person popped on their social media and said, I support marriage equality. And if you don't, then get the fuck off my page. And... (laughs) What? Yeah, well, obviously someone had a change of heart over that period, and didn't they? And it's great they, they had a change of heart, but I would have loved yeah, to totally. have heard the story about how you went from arguing with me about same-sex marriage being a sin to get the fuck off my page, because that story of growth would have been much more convincing to people who haven't yet come around that than just fuck off my page. Um, yeah, yeah, completely. Especially um, seeing that was a real formative thing for me X amount of years prior when they were someone who was in charge of a lot of things and they had such strong views against homosexuality. But you know what? Maybe in, in some ways you, you were the catalyst for them to start thinking about that because, yeah, you know, I think about some of the conversations I have even recently with some people about different things and I never go in wanting to convince somebody to change their mind necessarily. You know, I'll, I'll try and give them my perspective and why I think a certain way. And I'm always open to changing my mind as well. But I I guess when when I feel passionately about something and I still can't convince someone of my perspective, then there comes a point, which I'm sure you did as well, there's a point where you have to walk away. Yeah, it's exasperating. You've got to give up. Yeah, but perhaps that point that you've made causes them to actually, when things have cooled down, to think, "Mm, okay, well, obviously they're being passionate about this for a reason, Maybe there's something I can read to find out why. It's like when we were talking to Jacinta Carbun about the impact of inequality in the workplace for women and in society in the broader scale for women and how she had to take that person on a journey. It was a man. We can say it was a man because she said it was a man. She had to take one of her male colleagues on a journey and say, okay, so are you okay with your daughter earning half as much or, you know, a percentage (laughs) of what... Their male oh. counterpart earns up with the same qualifications, or we shouldn't your sister have to ask Jenny mother. if it's okay, though. Like, no, exactly, we shouldn't have to check with Jenny first, <laughs> honestly. No, we shouldn't by any means, not by a long shot. Sometimes we have to use whatever means we can, though, to wake people up to the fact that what they're saying isn't necessarily fully thought out. So, the conversation we had with Sally last episode is so important to me because Sally's a trans woman. 
and not because she's a trans woman, but because she's talking about diversity and inclusion now still. These stories that we're mm. sharing, uh, you know, from a long time ago, um, it's it's still going on. Could you imagine with all of this stuff we've been talking about here that happened in 2009 for us and don't be gay in 2009, I could have never employed a trans person. Could you imagine? I did employ a trans person after I left Darwin in the position I was in. Mm. And there's really not much to say about that because- They're a person. That, they're a person. They're a person. And they did a great job and they brought amazing skills to the job that I employed them for. But geez, did I see some bigotry around the ranks, even to the point of one of the people that actually also worked for the station, dead naming that person because mm. they'd known them before they transitioned. And, ooh, yeah, uh, you know, like that's 12 years ago now. Um, it still yeah. happens, though. I'm not just talking about trans issues or gay issues. No, Racism. It, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. there are some awful things being said about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. There are terrible things about migrants yeah. or whatever label we want to kind of bring down to someone like a refugee who's been locked up for nine years. There's mm. all sorts of stuff going on still. And I wonder if we will ever wake up, whether we'll ever reach that kind of, you know, let the sunshine in moment that they had in the 60s, apparently. Nice, and wasn't it? Obviously, I thought, well, that looks good. And I came back down into this lifetime and <gasps> fuck. <laughs> It was a lie. It was oh. a lie. <laughs> Twenty-six-year-old Louise, I think, became maybe twenty-eight-year-old Louise, or or twenty-nine-year-old Louise, however old she was. Um, and I could not do that anymore. I hadn't until we started our own business. And I suppose it's easy to call ourselves leaders when there's only two of us and our studio audience of felines. <laughs> Um, and we keep leading each other astray, but yeah. <laughs> but you know what? That that last the last time that I was a manager, I couldn't do it anymore because I felt like I had to protect people so much from mm. the culture, not just the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, no, women, even people of a certain age. You yeah. know, they they yeah. get bullied by yeah, other was... groups. So there's all sorts of. Oh, yeah. Discrimination that goes on. Definitely some ageism and also the inequity of people further up making a lot of money, a lot, a lot of money and making a lot of money off your creative talent and then telling you that they can't pass that on to you. And not only can they not pass that on to you, but you're going to get paid minimum wage and also you need to work all those hours for free because if you don't do it, then somebody else will because everybody wants so this great. job. Everybody wants the job. And there's not an, enough opportunities, so we're going to take your creativity and your passion and get everything out of that we can for 38 grand a year. You want to work 38 grand a year and work 15-hour days? So I've got the job for you. <laughs> it's so glamorous. You're going to love it. it. speaks to the culture of these industries, doesn't it? Because you And, know, a, and not just extent, media. This is not just media. This well, is across other industries. Look at how... At the moment, even with nurses, you know, how you've yeah. got governments coming out saying, oh, yes, we really appreciate all the nurses and all they've done for us, especially over the last two years. Fucking pay them. Yeah, clapping Give doesn't help. Give them a pay rise. Don't clap. I can stand it in my driveway for fucking hours clapping. <laughs> all I'm going to get is sore hands and need a nurse. Pay them. <laughs> Put some people through training and start putting more resources into healthcare. Fucking give them money. You know what? Clap as you give them a pay rise. Well done. Here's an extra you know, 20 grand. On and your, then also on your do it for annual. some teachers as well. Fuck. Yeah, yeah. While you're at it, let's make a list. Let's, let's, make, <laughs> let's make a list of all the people in society who are fucked over. And it's everybody except the 1% in power. Anyway. Fuck the patriarchy. <laughs> You, s <laughs> you said we weren't going to say fuck the patriarchy every episode. Oh, look, you know, but we get ourselves to these little states, don't we? I'm in a tizzy. I'm in a tizzy and I'm not even halfway through <laughs> our run sheet here. I know. I want to bring it back. I just know I want to bring it back to – so that – that time where I was your boss was the last time that I was somebody's direct boss like that because I left that job feeling like I couldn't – I didn't want to be in charge of anyone anymore because I was disappointing people that were below me who I couldn't look after and I felt like I, I, I really wanted to look after them because I saw me in them and I saw how much they cared and I saw their passion for what they were doing. Mm -hmm. Um. 
But also further up the chain, I saw the exploitation of an industry and how people would work so hard to do what they love doing to be rewarded in fucking pittance, to have to hide themselves, to have to tone themselves down to be a brand for somebody instead of their own unique person um and that that pressure of being in the middle was kind of shit you know it is kind of shit middle (laughs) management is no place for the faint-hearted because you're disappointing people all over the place above you below you beside you i've tried to advocate up in my life as much as i can Mm. but there's only so far you can advocate up well, yeah, uh, and, you know, it, clearly this is something that, that really sort of touches your heart as well. And uh, it's touched mine and uh, yeah, I speak about it without being able to be affected by it, probably because my response to it is anxiety, you know, <laughs> like when I feel like I can't be all that I need to be or feel that I need to be for everybody that is in my team or everybody that I'm trying to impress with my team's performance, then I get incredibly anxious. And that's something that I don't want. You know, that's something that leads to burnout. It it does lead to burnout. (laughs) And it did lead to burnout um, for me a lot of times. Actually, I I wonder now if some of the episodes I call depressive are episodes of burnout. (laughs) Look, you know, and I think, you know, just as much as anybody else in in whatever they're doing, sometimes we become a product of the industry that that we're in, you know, but you've found a way out of that. Yeah. At that point, all that time ago where I decided I wasn't going to be a manager anymore, I thought I really want to be a radio announcer and create Hmm. and I love the radio. Um and if I can just do it for myself and not have to be in charge of anybody, then I can weather that on my own. Do you know what I mean? I can mm. – because when I left Darwin, I didn't have another job lined up and I just could not do it anymore. And I actually thought at that time, is this it? Is this where there's no more career for me? Because I felt that at that time. Is this the end of my radio career? Because you don't Mm. leave a job in radio without having another one lined up because anyone will tell you very quickly that you shouldn't even go on holidays because when you come back, someone's (laughs) going to take your job, which, (laughs) as we discussed in a previous episode, they did. So that happened. (laughs) (laughs) That happened. Um, (laughs) And and so at that point, I thought, you know, that might be the end of that. Am I okay with that? And- I wasn't, but I, I did it because I co- couldn't do the alternative. Um, and in that case, I didn't burn any bridges or explode them on the way out. So it you were didn't. Still collecting the kerosene, honey. <laughs> <It was stuck. laughs> I was still building up the kerosene. So uh, you know, it wasn't that long before I had people calling me up asking me if I'd come work for them. So I think uh, I was unim unemployed at that stage for like it was three months and I really ended up just taking a holiday in between jobs is what it kind of became but I did decide that continuing in the industry I wouldn't be a manager because of those things and if I just I can just put all my resources into making me the best version of me so that I can use my power and influence to help other people um, in the best way that I can do it and that will be enough. And I I know the culture of what I'm in and I understand what they're like. And if I can just play by enough rules that I can be successful and get to the top, maybe I can create change or find a way to just deal with it. Because also this is the only thing that I thought I wanted to do at that point. And I had if we go back to episode three, tied my entire identity to being a a radio person. Mm. It was my salvation for depression, for, you know, those suicidal ideations on the floor of the shower. So, I don't know what I'm getting at anymore. Well, I think, you know, what's essentially happened is that, for want of a better term, you were kind of beaten by a system, you know, like you... (laughs) You did your very best to bring the best of yourself into the role that you got, yet you still had those other expectations to meet, which went against your values. Yeah. 
And yeah. so at that point, when you stepped out of that, you were saying essentially, look, <laughs> I know this is a big fucking bit of my identity, but Jesus Christ, this doesn't actually make me happy in the slightest because it's not actually aligning with anything that's important to me. Well, maybe not that's probably a little bit dramatic no, because I'm a gay boy, but, <laughs> but, you know, it's not aligning completely with my values, so I need to get out. It's not aligning enough. And if it's not aligning enough and someone else won't come to the party of helping it align, then what else is there? Yeah, which... Clearly I'm which, traumatized. <laughs> yeah. And, Didn't you we know, say uh, get some perspective until we talk about these things and we wouldn't have so, so much drama? Because this is well, some, this you know is some drama here. Ready? But this is... <laughs> well, that would be toxic positivity mm-hmm. saying that. Oh, there we go. You know, that would be toxic positivity ah. saying that. Because toxic positivity <laughs> says it's not okay to get upset about anything. Yeah. But, you know, the, the, the great loss for the industry that you left is that they had a leader in place that would have been able to bring in a really beautiful leadership style into an industry and show people how to lead well and to lead differently. That's your line about Suzanne. I know, but I'm upset about it now. Oh, my God. <clears throat> Maybe I'll get my shit together while we listen to this bit from Suzanne Mercier then, uh, who helped us realise <laughs> that as leaders and managers, we learn from the style of those which we've worked under. When I was about 17 and I was working in a department store and there was the after-sales office and because of the times that it was in the 80s, it was all women that worked in that office and mm-hmm. the woman who was in charge was someone who was renowned for striking fear into everybody and I was petrified of her as well because of everybody else's opinion and then she must have picked up on it because she turned to me and said, you're scared of me, aren't you? Wow. And I looked her in the eye and said, no, I'm not scared of you. And then continued with the conversation. And then she just softened completely. Mm. So it it seemed like that there was a wall that she was putting up there because she felt that she had to. If she was seen for who Mm. she really was, that she Mm. couldn't be an effective manager. But she was the loveliest person. But nobody could see past her, her style of management because that seemed to be what she felt she needed to do well and often we learn our style of management from the previous manager that we worked Mm. with Mm. so if the if her style of management was learned from a male manager then that's entirely you know she thought she had to do that so um, yeah i can understand that and and uh, how perceptive of her that she recognized it and changed what she was doing with me not with anybody else yeah (laughs) Uh oh i see (laughs) i cracked her (laughs) oh there you go did anyone else get the benefit of it possibly i i I think we softened some things along the way (laughs) yeah well i think I think also people get into you know, management and leadership roles and it takes them a while to find their feet because that's a whole new game for them. They're in uncertain mm. territory. And, and often the way that we handle uncertainty is to go into control and, and to reduce our vulnerability. We, you know, we adapt or adopt certain behaviours and, and those sorts of things. And they certainly aren't, at least in that space, um, you know, particularly good for people that are sort of in the, in the role or at the level that you were before or at the level below you. So, yeah, it's an interesting – it's, it's just such a complex area, isn't it? I find it but, interesting that people think that women are more aggressive when they get to the top because uh, oh, from yes. my own experience, I've, I've – I've had quite a few um, female managers and leaders, and they have by far been the best leaders that I've had in my career. Well, thank you, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. <laughs> there's that lovely expression that if you if, if the miracle occurs within five kilometres, claim it. <laughs> But yeah, I've so always funny. found that, that, that women actually bring a lot more of themselves. So I tend to find leadership more natural coming from women because they connect more with people, in my experience, whereas men tend to connect more with the task. Yes, well, that, that is um, in general true. I think that um, I think that there are a lot of men who are starting to embrace the more feminine side of leadership, which is much more concerned about people. So there's a lot of good men out there wanting to find that balance. Hmm. Um, but yeah, I think that um, there's the old double standard that what's seen as assertive in a guy is seen as aggressive in a woman, and that's society. If you ask women, many of the women have the same response. Oh, she's aggressive. Hmm. Um, but in actual fact, she's just doing something that a guy would do. And it's just seen very differently. So, yeah, I think we've still got a lot of unconscious bias to sort out. No question. One of my earliest managing jobs, because I started managing people when I was 23 or so, in the interview, the alpha douche that was the interviewer 
uh, specifically told me that if he gives this job to a woman, he doesn't want to pioneer. I don't want you to go out and pioneer anything. You know, I want to give this to somebody who will do the job right and not make this all about being a woman. Right. Further to that, in roles where I've been managing large teams of people, especially where people have been older than me and with a lot of experience, I mean, I think that imposter syndrome has certainly crept in there Mm. um, because, you know, they're more experienced, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they, you know, have more creativity or the Mm. the right perspective for the job. Mm -hmm. But I I would say that as a 23-year-old doing that, different than an almost 40-year-old with now this perspective, I felt like I had to mould myself to be more of, I suppose, more of that masculine energy in, you know, take that on. So, as much as I want to take Andy's compliment, he was probably talking about (laughs) somebody else because I'm a a bit of... Absolutely, you know that, Louise. I'm a bit of a ball buster. Um, (laughs) Because I think that in that I had to harden myself to compete on that level. And I think that was, you know, one of the things, this is turning into my therapy session, but one of the (laughs) things that turned me away from being a manager of a large group is kind of, you know, having those two masters, having all those people underneath you who you as uh, me as a woman wanted to lift up and do the best for, Mm. but then having those masters above that saw them as numbers on a spreadsheet. Yep. Finding that balance. I don't think there's a question. I think I'm just venting. No, it's great. You're absolutely um, no. right. And um, I think that what what's really powerful of what you, about what you've just said is that it, it, it represents that there are so many different styles of feminine leadership. There's not one. Uh, and, and you have to actually meet people where they are to change the, the, um, the story anyway so that you can you know, sort of share with them another way to do things. So I think that if you, if you were to do that, you probably wouldn't have got ahead. And I, mm. I think back on my career and I don't think that I had that bolshy sort of approach and I, I would actually not put myself out there. In fact, you know, when I was in my early days of running my own business, I, I sort of hoped that I'd planted the seeds and they were all going to come to me. So it took me ages to get that I have to actually put myself out there and wasn't comfortable at all. So um, I think that people who work inside the corporate environment, they have to be stronger. They have to actually, you know, be able to stand up and, and give an opinion and, and uh, you know, play the game to some degree. So it doesn't suit everybody. You know, it's just you've got to find your way and, and place to be a leader. I suppose the thing is, we don't want to play by those rules anymore because look what happens to us. Well, I mean, to us, to me personally, if I play by those rules, because Mm. it ends up with me burning out and getting depressed and having anxiety attacks and feeling like I'm compromising every inch of myself Mm. to play in somebody else's game who I will never win and I can only shift the needle ever so incrementally before somebody else knocks the needle back again. Yeah. So we have a chance with what we're doing to step out of that mould and create something for ourselves with our rules, our way. Mm -hmm. So what actually are those rules? Well, I'm glad you asked because I don't (laughs) know either, you know, and this is the point of the story. This is, you know, harp time, harp time at 12 months ago. Harking back to even, I don't know how far we are into this episode at the moment, but (laughs) right at the beginning with our sketch, 12 months ago, I started saying something to the effect of, you know, we don't live in a vacuum. Yes. Because it became really clear to me at that point that, you know, as much as we try to sanitise our environments, you know, as much as we build our echo chambers to suit our own beliefs and our values, we line our little castles with people who agree with us. Mm -hmm. Um, Sooner or later, we need to interact with the outside world. Uh, You know, and on top of that, different events that we face can also trigger the same old feelings and patterns of behaviour. How many times did I say to you of a morning, oh, I've done some journaling this morning and I didn't have a little cry? <laughs> because something had come up that I thought about with relation to my family and I just, I got it out. But, you know, as much as I tried to put on that toxic positivity brave face and said, no, I'm all right, yeah, no, I'm all good, I'm all, yeah, yeah, no, time's passed and water under the bridge and blah, blah, blah. No. 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 Because it's not linear. It's cyclical. It's not even cyclical. It's, it's, I don't know what it is. Mm. It's, it's almost like that multiverse kind of theory. You can get it's hit the- by it anywhere at any time. <laughs> It's a multiverse of trauma. Yeah, exactly. A bit like grief, you know, like because, you know, let's not forget that during that patch of time as well, I was really still, you know, in early stages of grief Mm. around losing my dad. It was a year in, but still grief has got no time. No, it doesn't expire. 
It doesn't start within a certain time. It doesn't end within a certain time. In fact, you know, I, I still think about my mum, who I lost, you know, nine months after moving to Darwin and yeah. get emotional when I think about her because I miss her, yeah. you know, and I miss my dad and I, and I miss all of these people that – that were important to me when I was growing up and are still important to me, but they're not with me anymore. Yeah. So it's not something that just leaves us, you know. Seven-year-old me asked my grandmother, you know, when are things going to get back to normal? This is after she'd lost her daughter, my auntie. When are things going to get back to normal and everyone's just going to be happy again? And her reaction was to my mum, Patty, get this kid out of here. He's stupid or whatever. I didn't know anything about grief. I didn't know anything about death. I didn't. All I knew was that before I was born, my grandfather had died and they all seemed pretty happy. Not that he'd died, Mm. but they all seemed to be getting on life pretty well. All I wanted to know at that point was when things were going to return to some sense of normality, much like people are saying now after the pandemic, when are we going to get back to normal? Is well, there, that, things have yeah, changed. That's it. Life changes and we need to be able to adapt. Grief is a part of that and in a lot of ways. We, we don't live in a vacuum. <laughs> we don't you know, live in we, a vacuum. <laughs> we, when we come to work, we bring all of those other things with us. Oh, bring you your know, whole we, self to work, like the authenticity catchphrase says. But, geez, if you think you, you can show it, if you think you can actually say something about it, bring it by all means, but don't do anything with it. Could you imagine if um, if we brought our whole selves to work and instead of us unleashing our trauma on this podcast, this is what we put on the radio? <laughs> Well, I tell you what, it would make some interesting headlines. It would probably get like a good, <laughs> good listenership. Of course, you know, we know that people do like a bit of a salacious conversation. Oh, salacious. I Listen, can't imagine if, it would have gone down well with management. Maybe we can send that out in the press release for this one, see if someone picks it up. Listen to two former radio hosts cry about their life. <laughs> All this discussion about work, um, not our work now, uh, someone else's mm-hmm. work, but I think this is probably a really good time to introduce Jane Madden, mm-hmm. board member for the Black Dog Institute and chair for the Fred Hollows Foundation. And with a public service career of at least 30 years, uh, where she's been in some of the most senior levels of government, she knows a lot about mental health in the workplace. So how has the conversation about mental health changed in that time? I had a career uh, in government for over 30 years before now working uh, as a board director and uh, also running my own advisory firm. And the conversations that we're having in mental health, and as I said, right across different sectors, are very different than what they were five or 10 years ago. I've had the opportunity of serving on the Black Dog Institute board for almost seven years now. And during that time, I think we've seen a, a really increased awareness across workplaces, academic and uh, other educational institutions, and even the home, that, um, you know, mental health can affect everybody. And in fact, you know, I think the current uh, levels are that, you know, one in five Australians will experience some mental illness at some point in their life, so that it touches all each and every one of us. And of course, with us spending a large part of our lives in the workplace, it's only natural that there will be mental illness uh, in the workplace. People do need to think about their mental health, uh, both amongst your colleagues, amongst your staff, and especially if you're a leader. So I do think that There's been increased awareness on the importance of talking about mental health, just as we also talk about physical health and occupational health and safety. And the conversations have, I think, fortunately, become less stigmatised than they used to be. Do you think when it comes to modern workplace leadership that part of that role is also being a counsellor to staff? To some extent, but I think there also needs to be a recognition that uh, a mental illness is not something that can be uh, at times quickly fixed by counselling staff you know, in a sometimes I've seen it in a brusque way, like, you know, get over it, you know, mm. you're just feeling down, get out of it. Um, you know, there will be times where, yes, support uh, in the workplace is necessary, but there will be times also where you do need to, you know, seek professional help because with appropriate treatment, it's really important to know that many people can and do recover from mental health illness. It almost feels like that there needed to be some kind of flashpoint to happen for businesses to really take mental health seriously. And this is something that our other guest today, Annie Harvey, who is a patent interrupter for workplaces, has noticed across time as well. It's taken a pandemic for companies to put 
well-being, mental health and well-being at the top of their list to look after employees. And sometimes people just say, everything's getting really serious. Can we just have a, a bit of joy and can you do a laughter session for us? Which is great. So Annie works with adults and teens to help them maximise well-being and resilience. And she shows people not only how to be still just for a few moments, but also shares her own strategies to prevent burnout. She works as a keynote speaker and runs workshops, training and one-to-one mentoring and coaching. And she refers to herself as a pattern interrupter. So what does that mean? A stint last week for literally 10 minutes at a conference. And there'd been a lot of tears through some triggering talks. And quite often I'm kind of brought on as a pattern interrupt at conferences after things that you know talks that might upset people and I'm brought on to lift the mood and still pe- people were crying but it was different kinds of tears it was quite <laughs> fascinating to watch room that was within three or four minutes what do you mean pattern interrupt what's um how would so you an define in, an that interrupt a, so uh, yeah sometimes I've just been called that so it's you know when you when you are triggered and an audience is triggered or anyone is triggered by something they've heard in a talk or on the news or whatever. And I come in and I'm the pattern interrupter to to release that laughter really quickly. And that interrupts your stress response and turns turns off your fight or flight and turns on your um, relaxation response, really. Hmm. So it's a a bit of a circuit breaker, I guess you could call it. I like the idea of you, like, that's your official job title, pattern interrupter. Get it printed on a T-shirt, it's on a hat. All sorts of weird titles in this job, yeah. Annie the Activator last week. So we've been talking a little bit about burnout earlier in this episode and, you know, we've all known someone, if not ourselves, who has either burnt out or got very close to that feeling of burnout. And I feel a lot like the onus is often put onto employees for self-care, but it's also up to employers to provide an environment in which burnout doesn't take hold in the first place. So at this point, we were curious to know if Jane Madden had noticed any changes in employer attitude to how staff are treated in the workplace. Have you seen much in the way of workplaces and um, employers realising that sometimes their treatment of staff leads to poor mental health? Oh, this is a tricky area. Yes, there have been some recognition of that and the use of services like EAP, both in the public and private sector, are there so that people who may be suffering from mental health or need, um, you know, a neutral or third party to talk to um, can have the right conversations and get the right sort of tools, if you like, to manage their mental health and to also sort of push back and, if necessary, make legitimate complaints where there is really uh, egregious behaviour uh, happening. It's not true to think that um, people with a mental health issue or illness can just pull themselves out of it. And certainly um, in some workplaces, that notion of keeping a stiff upper lip and uh, never complaining, I think, uh, affects some people's uh, mental health adversely. And it's good that we are realising, you know, the fact and and fiction of some of these uh, myths. I have noticed recently in some of the workplaces that I've been in, there's been a real shift around the approach to what we used to call a sicky, to the point where some leaders and managers would say themselves that they sometimes need a mental health day. I wonder if this kind of attitude has actually been instrumental in helping us to reduce the incidence of unplanned leave. Look, um, I think that's right, Andy. I think a really important thing to keep in mind is you know majority of mental illness in the workplace is treatable and in some cases it, it is preventable so you know if you've been really pushing uh, the boat out on heavy heavy workload um, and you're feeling you know exhausted maybe a bit fragile it's much better to take that mental health day than to have a need later on you know to take three or four sick days each month for untreated depression or nervous anxiety or nervous exhaustion and and I think having that environment where you are, you know, monitoring your own mental health, but also you have managers and a workplace that's supportive of people, you know, taking uh, the time as they need and perhaps are amenable to people taking, you know, that mental health day, as you say, it's a good thing. And actually the company, the employer will benefit in the longer term because, uh, you know, it's an old fashioned saying that there is that stitch in time saves nine. And it actually, I think, can be relatable to giving ourselves, you know, that sick day, that rest day permission to have downtime uh, especially if you've been working hard or you have other factors uh, responsibilities in your lives that are really causing you a lot of pressure and anxiety when it's come to me leaving workplaces it's never been about the money it's been about the value that I feel like um, 
I have as a person. Mm. If I haven't felt valued, then, or if I've seen other people that I feel are treated um, differently, then that's been my reason for doing something else. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the statistics would back you up around that, that, uh, you know, it's the quality of, you know, one's treatment that is frequently cited by people, you know, as the reason to leave an organization. Now, it's pretty easy for someone to say they're feeling burnt out, but Annie Harvey was able to give us a few insights into not just what causes it, but how it manifests in the workplace. You said we don't recognize the signs of burnout. What are they? You don't recognise them at all? Do you reckon you've ever been in that space? Oh, 100%. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but you said we often don't um, recognise them. I, I suppose no. we recognise it when we've hit the wall at the end and it's all too hard and we quit the job. Yes. Um, but m- maybe there are some signs earlier on that might be good for us to know about or we'll so see. So if you – I mean, the World Health Organisation a couple of years ago um, basically said that – Burnout is a syndrome and it results from chronic workplace stress over a period of time that hasn't been successfully managed. Now, obviously, it's not just about workplace stress. Mm -hmm. We bring all our other stresses into our workplace, but they give us three things to look out for. And you kind of have to have all three. So one of them is emotional exhaustion, or sometimes I call that the Sunday night feeling, but you have to have it regularly. It's not like a one-off. And then attached to that is cynicism about you know, your job or your family or your work colleagues or whatever. And then the third thing to have on top of that is what they call reduced self-efficacy, which is uh, a reduced belief in you being competent in doing your job, basically. And if you have all three, in theory, you're you're on a journey to burning out if you're not already there. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I hadn't actually thought of burnout as being, I suppose, a... Um, a medical term. I, I thought mm. of it's just being that emotional feeling, but um, now you define it like that, I can definitely say that I've experienced those three in uh, situations where uh, w- it didn't take much longer than the starts of those feelings to, you know, it was all too hard. Exactly. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think it's really critical that people know how close they are to what, you know, what we call falling off the cliff because when, once you fall off, once you're burnt out, it takes a really long time to heal. It's not like, you know, bouncing back, as we like to call it, after a couple of weeks. It can take six months or even up to two years to actually heal from that. So I think it's great that the World Health Organization have kind of put it on the map for us and recognize it as a syndrome. I know I've walked the cliff face of burnout many times throughout my career and from earlier in the episode, it certainly sounds like I fell off the cliff. Um, (laughs) That's not to say, though, that all businesses are doing a bad job. No, 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 not at all. I mean, I've worked for some really great businesses who put incentives and activities in place to improve staff wellbeing. We do have some doubts, though, about sometimes whether the tactics that employers put in are tone deaf. We've explored that with Jane Madden. I'm thinking there's also a level of risk with some of the ways that some companies actually do try to promote a good culture. I'm thinking of a particular example where a company that had a mandated day every month where they had cake for everybody. And then every now and then they decided they might actually donate the the proceeds of that to a charity or for one reason or other it didn't happen. But then when it didn't happen, that actually bred suspicion amongst the ranks. Yeah. And it's funny because, as I said, that, that mark of integrity to say that you'll do something and then not to follow through it makes people you know not have the trust in their team leaders in their executives and it may only be a small thing but people do have to deliver what they say they do and quite quickly trust can break down it can take a long time to build but it can you know quite quickly uh, uh, break down and even schools like you know Harvard Business School are talking about you know the absolute criticality of authentic leadership and having you know people committed to say what they're doing and working according to how they say they're going to work and then if it's not happening reporting and that ha- honesty that integrity um, is important even though it might be uh, bearing get bad news or acknowledging that you haven't been able to meet you know ambitious targets that boards or the company had set it kind of feels like we need to focus more on the quality of relationships rather than giving people things and those things will happen more naturally if the relationships are good yeah there's a really interesting debate waging at the moment about how important you know performance bonuses and remuneration
remuneration. And uh, I know from some of the surveys I've seen that particularly in the last 12 months with what we've gone through with the coronavirus is people realize money, it, you know, a certain amount is certainly necessary, but it doesn't necessarily buy your happiness. And if you're feeling, you know, you've got flexibility with your workplace, that your, you know, contribution is valued, you're respected by colleagues, they're also respectful of, you know, other pressures upon you. These things, you know, have a much better monetary uh, uh, reward than, um, you know, sheer dollars and cents. Uh, and so that it's entered a new phase, I think, with uh, what, what workplaces have done uh, in the last uh, 12 to 18 months. And the future of the workplace is really, really changing. You know, that presenteeism, just being there and turning up is, you know, so much less important now. People are looking to see what the real contribution of people are when they're not actually in the same physical location. Offices in Australia aren't going to be the same uh, as they were before COVID. People are coming in not to just not to work because they can work anywhere. They're coming in, um, you know, to collaborate. So meeting spaces are more important. And the second reason that I hear people are coming in is to, for all those cultural reasons, you know, to connect with their colleagues, to see each other, to have a sense that they're working as part of a team, not just, you know, in isolated studies and bedrooms across the country. Um, and I think that's changing, you know, the way organisations will function going forward and the way organisations will also treat uh, employees. But I think it can be a new normal that will be better, both for mental health and hopefully for organisational culture generally. So what are the hallmarks of some of the better cultures out there that you've seen? The standout characteristic uh, to me is uh, integrity in the workplace. So to have CEOs and executives saying they would like to have this type of culture and then not modelling or being authentic themselves with regard to it. So um, if you have authentic leadership, if you have a culture that I said uh, earlier is respectful, is you know supportive of employees as individuals, makes everyone feel you know valued for their respective roles in an organisation, you'll find that it's a happier workplace, it's a more positive culture, and the results um, will, will be higher too. Burnout is a pretty big pain point for businesses throughout the country without much consensus on how to approach. I saw um, uh, the stats, I think, said uh, what we lose $33 billion to burnout. I'm, I'm going off the top of my head there. Is that close to what it is? Well, I would think it would be a lot more across the world at the moment. Yes. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. And certainly in the next 18 months, two years, I reckon. So how can workplaces kind of combat that then? I mean, if if... if the way that we treat employees heads them in that direction and then it's, I mean, not only bad for mental health but bad for their bottom line. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, we live in a bit of a blame society and quite often as if we're employed, we would blame the company for our work hours and lack of balance and all that kind of thing. But where I sit is where you can take responsibility. I mean, yes, it's definitely down to the company with regards to having all the processes and policies in place certainly supporting people who have serious mental illness but I kind of sit in the the prevention side I guess mm. people being proactive and, and education because so many people don't even know some of the signs of burnout I guess um, and then how they can put some really simple strategies and that's really where I come from is simple that they can walk out the door and put into practice in their life pretty quickly but yeah it's it's a really big thing and also you know I talk about We've heard a lot about absenteeism and we can measure that, but there's lots of presenteeism. Mm. And I would definitely have been guilty of that, even potentially when I was a school teacher 10 years ago, was, you know, you're kind of there, but the lights aren't on kind of thing, yeah. if you know what I mean, which is not good. Yeah. That, that's a term that I um, I was really struck by when we were reading through some of the research, uh, this concept of presenteeism. Do we need to sort of take a step back and learn how to actually be be more relaxed do we need to look after ourselves better in the workplace yeah absolutely and i think you know sometimes i do a presentation called it's not bubbles and band-aids so a lot of people will say well i look after my well-being i have my regular massage and you know, i have bubbles with my friends at the weekend or i have a bubble bath and i'm not telling people to stop any of that but i think that's often a band-aid it's a short-term strategy and we need to look at within businesses and without with ourselves how we can have a long-term strategy for how we look after ourselves and it's it's the age-old thing of you know if we could fly anywhere at the moment safely we'd be told to put our oxygen mask on first 
before helping others. And and I've only got to this space of teaching people this because I didn't used to do that. I would never, you know, we put ourselves at the bottom of the list. And it's only through learning the hard way that I've climbed back out up, up to the top of the cliff and now teaching people how to do that or the signs, if nothing else. I like this idea of keeping the bubble baths in the mix, but what are some of the other things that we could benefit from looking at? When I look at self-care, um, you know, we all ha- we all know what our own individual self-care strategies might be but i i try to think about things that maybe people can't google so i look at what healthy relationships are jim Rohn once famously said with we're, we're the average of the five people we spend most time with mm. so if you if you just count that on your hand and you two might have to include your cats in that as well <laughs> yeah, probably <laughs> spend most there's time a bit of laziness with. going on there there's a lot of destruction <laughs> going on in my house <laughs> <laughs> um, and then you're, you know, you're the average of those five people. So if you wanted to, in if you wanted to start looking after yourself, or I don't know, learning a new skill, practicing meditation, or learning how to swim, or whatever it is, or going on a particular diet, you don't, you don't marry condo those people and ditch them out of your lives, mm-hmm. but you start bringing people into your circle of influence that can, that can raise that average, because we all know those people that don't encourage us to do that necessarily, and I think. When we're sick or we're not feeling great, we don't necessarily hang around with the right people or the right strategies. So it's not just people, it's books and podcasts like this, all sorts of things Mm -hmm. that you can raise your average in depending on how you're going to look after yourself. So just like Sally Goldner told us in the last episode, one of the best ways to avoid burnout is to make sure that workplace values align authentically with the values of those working in the business. It's not always going to be a perfect fit, though. You know, let's be honest. We know from our conversations with Suzanne and Hugh that perfection is, you know, it's an elusive beast. So for those times when imperfection pinches us, we wanted to know what kind of resources are available. Like, what would someone like Jane Madden do? What are some of the tools that are available to help people in the workplace with that? There's a lot of online tools now. Certainly, most of the organizations have through Googling Black Dog Institute, Mental Health Workplace, or any of the other major organizations. There's a lot of videos that give real-life depictions about scenarios that have played out. You know, there are some responsibilities individually. If you really, your mental health condition is impairing your ability to do any requirements requirements of your job, you might be able to get some reasonable adjustments that help you perform your role. But it may be that you also are impairing the team, affecting others. And there is, I think, now a requirement that with insurance company that if you don't disclose a mental illness, it can disentitle someone from workers' compensation, you know, should they suffer major exacerbation of a mental health illness. So I think one needs to sort of be brave to have some of those discussions and to talk about what is possible. And it's good that we've got anonymous tools that gives us ways to start the conversation, no matter how difficult it may be. And I think I think the one thing that I just want to remind you of listeners is that it isn't something that is off to the side and something that people, you know, can't talk about. It affects so many of us and will affect so many of us in our life. There's virtually no one I know in all my different roles that hasn't either got themselves a mental health problem or had one or had family members. We're all touched by it and we just sometimes need to sort of take those first steps and you may be surprised to find, you know, your manager or your colleagues actually may well be much more sympathetic and understanding than sometimes we fear they might be. It's been a bit of a stroll to come this back episode. to Hugh point. <laughs> this has been a long walk. Do I need the harp again? <laughs> Hang on. It, we got If we got a flashback to an earlier episode. Um, oh. <laughs> this harp Walk sound effect me. was worth its money, it which was. was nothing. I didn't pay for it. It came with the roadcaster. Oh, you know what? If this had been an actual walk, I think I would have burnt off at least a Mars bar by now. It's been a pretty long stroll. As long as it wasn't to... upstairs, because gays don't walk upstairs, I've heard. Correct. Exactly. We're too lazy. <laughs> Um, Hugh Kearns, though. Back to Hugh Kearns. Yeah, yeah. He he made a really great point about creating something new and how we, Louise, define success for us. Is it just about the money? Apparently not, or we'd have more. Um, Or is it about being able to live our authentic values while holding a space where we and those that we work with can look after ourselves? 
it kind of feels like culturally we've kind of had a bit of a shift in the definition of success as well because when thinking back to the last Olympic Games, our medalists would get bronze, but they were being described as failures mm -hmm. through a lot of the media for not getting gold. Do we need to bit of, have a bit of a look at ourselves and, and back off? Well, again, you know, that, that comes back to the expectations, doesn't it? You know, like in uh, what, what people expect of it. And again, uh, Australia was ha having a fairly good run for a while. You think that's what we should have all the time. And but that's probably not realistic either. Is you know, for Australia doing well, you know, all, all the other countries are trying as hard as well. You know, they're just not backing off, and so they're trying as well. And so it's unrealistic to expect you should win all the time. You know, why why wouldn't other people win occasionally? And so that's that expectations thing. And that's when yeah, sometimes you just have to realize no, this was the best we could do right now. It, it'd be lovely, lovely to win, but uh, not everyone's going to win. And uh, people have to learn how to cope with not winning and other people winning and cope with that because if only the win can be happy that means there's an awful lot of people who are going to be pretty miserable in the world and so you have to accept that people do the best they can sometimes win sometimes lose uh, you have to go with that and again that's when i sort of get annoyed people think winning is all that matters well that's a fairly limited sort of view of the world what about all the other people sometimes you do your best and sometimes it doesn't work out for a variety of reasons okay now i mean it, it only feels like i'm being slightly attacked now <laughs> um, which is good <laughs> But we it's love true. You, not, we love you. <laughs> it's true, though. Like, not everyone can win a trophy. Yeah. It doesn't mean that we can't be happy with our slice of the pie, though. We just need to get oh. out of our own way and cut ourselves a nice slice. That's an analogy I can get behind, unlike your secondhand chairs from the... <laughs> From My the second hand chairs behind the line in the sand. What? The what? marker in the sand. What's your second hand chair? I'd never heard that before. Are you just making up analogies? Yeah. <laughs> I love making up analogies. So there are probably a few people or a very small number of people who have a fairly accurate view of themselves, which is, I'm not the best, I'm not the worst, I'm just doing what I can here, you know, this is okay, and don't spend too much time doubting themselves, they just go, look, let's get on with things. And that's probably a fairly functional way to behave, really, which is, yeah, look, I'll do what I can, uh, and we'll, we'll cope with that as it comes out, but not so much worried about how other people feel me or see me. However, that's that's a fairly small number of people, really, I think, who are in that category. And for the rest of us, uh, and myself included, it's come to terms with this is a fair fairly normal thing in life, uh, that questioning process, and then get on with things. And there's something else that really stuck with us the last time we spoke to Hugh. So is it useful then to kind of have a bit of a look at who the best judge of what failure is? Maybe it's a bit of a clumsy way of putting it, but worst case scenario, if this project fails and we don't make money, then worst case scenario is the bank could foreclose, homelessness, that kind of thing, and the realistic nature of those sorts of things? Uh, for, for anybody in life, it's probably good to have a plan B. You know, like, let's say we do this thing. What if it doesn't work? Well, actually, I have another fallback position. I can do something else. We can get our money, whatever. Because if there's no plan B, like if you, if you take a risk and the whole thing falls apart, that there's a lot of pressure on at that point. And, and in some sense, the pressure is good, it makes you work, but also it's a bit scary. And so then you are, will you take a risk? Will you do things? Because this could be this could be the end of the world. So my view is it's probably good to have a plan B, which is, well, yeah, if that doesn't work, we actually can manage another way. It might not be the best, but we can manage it in some way. So if this fails, well, hang on, we have something else we can fall back on along that way. How, uh, instead of failure, the, the way I'd, I'd view it, let's say you do something new. Uh, if it doesn't work, okay, it wasn't what we expected, but we can do something else with it or we can re we can reimagine it or see it in a different way or something like that. Rather, failure, the failure word, I suppose, tends to be a final failure. There is no comeback from it. Like, it is the end, it's doomed. And generally, life isn't like that. You know, if this doesn't work, yeah, well, we can do something else and we'll have a plan B or we'll work our way around that sort of thing. And I suppose that's where a more sensible approach would be is, yeah, look, give it your best shot, but realize if it doesn't work, there'll be something else. If you're doubting yourself or you feel like an imposter every now and again, <laughs> welcome to the human race. Uh, there's nothing wrong with you. This is a normal enough feeling every now and again to have that thing. But then don't let it stop you doing things. Don't let it stop you doing the things you enjoy doing and do them because you want to do them. And I think that's the sort of summary is this is this is a fairly normal thing and, and get on with things and, and try out the things you like doing and enjoy. So here's the next uncomfortable question. Mm -hmm. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> Did we need more uncomfortable questions in this episode? Haven't, We're up to episode. haven't we all had enough? I think there's going to be a few more. This is episode 11 out of 42. Anyway. Why am I still paying for you therapy ready? then? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Um, but the question, the next uncomfortable question, you ready for it? Mm -hmm. How do we plan for the worst case scenario? 
Next time on Reframe of Mind, we'll speak to Derek McManus, who has turned his near-death experience in the line of duty into a durability model of strength. And when we're stepping into an unknown territory, what do we need to look at? My perspective to this overall is I went to work, I got shot, I fell down, I got up, I got better, I went back to work. I made a choice to become a policeman. I became a sniper. I became an underwater recovery diver, which is very dangerous in its own realm. I went away and trained with the SAS in counter-terrorism. I knew that that job that I was choosing to do was dangerous. So I had to take a very close look at the choices that I was making and the possible consequences of them. If you're concerned about yourself or someone you know, please seek professional advice and support. You can contact Beyond Blue on 1300 224 636 or at beyondblue.org.au. Or you can contact Lifeline on 13 11 14 or lifeline.org.au. More resources can be found on our website. You've been hearing our story. Now we really want to hear yours. Connect with at Reframe of Mind on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok and Twitter. Or connect with at Welcome Change Media on LinkedIn. You can also contact us via reframeofmind.com.au with your stories or suggestions for future topics. We'd like to thank today's guests for sharing their personal stories and insights. And for more information on any of the subjects, guests or references used in this episode, please see our show notes or reframeofmind.com.au. Reframe of Mind is a Welcome Change Media production. How many people have picked their nose listening to me? I wonder. I, I bet there's I'm a, sure they've done lots of things listening to you in the in the prisons. I used to. Did I, t- <laughs> I told you I used to get faxes from the prisons occasionally. No. Yeah. Really? There were stories around that sometimes prisoners tried to request songs to talk to other people through song. Come on, Eileen is not a request for the song. It's code for something else. Looking out my back door is. <laughs> Got one hand in my pocket. Um, <laughs> <laughs> jailbreak by ACTs. <laughs> and tonight, tonight by the Smashing Pumpkins. <laughs> <laughs>